of an open border. We thought it couldn't get much worse, but it did. So we are back in Arizona where the residents feel the effects of the Biden's open border policies each and every day. The effects of nearly 5 million illegal aliens released into U.S. communities. The effects of criminal alien gangs flooding the U.S. with illicit drugs. The effects of an unknown number of aliens on the terrorist watch list evading border patrol detection and disappearing into our communities. Like the one with ISIS ties from Uzbekistan who crossed the Arizona border back in February of 2022. The Department of Homeland Security's own published numbers show that the Tucson border patrol sector leads the nation in the southwest border encounters with at least 366,000 of the more than 1.3 million illegal, illegal alien encounters so far this fiscal year. Illegal immigration is such a problem here that last year, the Department of Homeland Security closed the Lukeville port of entry for more than a month during the holiday season when legitimate travel across the border is at its peak so that CBC officers could help process the huge number of illegal aliens entering the country. The rampant illegal immigration welcomed by the Biden administration devastated this area's holiday economy, but you don't have to believe me that the border is in chaos. You can believe the border uh, chief border patrol agent for the Tucson sector. According to Chief John Modlin, on April 30th, the border patrol and Tucson law enforcement interdicted over a, a load of more than 57 pounds of methamphetamine and more than 88 pounds of fentanyl. On April 24th, Chief posted on, on social media that agents had arrested an illegal border crosser who had an extensive criminal history, including convictions for the facilitation of homicide and aggravated assault with a weapon. On April 18th, agents arrested an illegal border crosser who also turned out to be convicted of a vicious assault. On the 14th of April, Tucson agents apprehended a group of illegal alien border crossers dressed in camouflage in a remote part of the sector. On the 8th of April, agents seized 158,000 in fentanyl pills. March 26, agents apprehended an illegal alien border crosser who was a gang member with a felony conviction for assault with a deadly weapon in California. On the 25th of March, they apprehended a group of 15 Ill illegal alien border crossers dressed in camouflage. On the 20th, agents apprehended an illegal alien border crosser um, for viciously assaulting a child. And those are just a few of the examples from the last couple of months that the Border Patrol knows about and tells the public. Imagine what is happening that Border Patrol doesn't know or that this administration won't let, won't let agents tell us. Of course, do you know who else knows what is going on on the border? The residents of the great state of Arizona know. And a few of them are here today to share how President Biden's open border policies negatively affected their communities and their lives. We will hear from a rancher who sees illegal aliens and camouflage on his land every day. We will hear from a mom, a mom whose family has been forever altered. Because President Biden refuses to prevent the Chinese government from teaming up with Mexican cartels to flood our country with fentanyl. We will hear from a Border Patrol chief who knows firsthand the disaster that President Biden's policies created on the southwest border and the negative effects that the open border has on agents' morale. And we will hear from a former sheriff's deputy about the dangerous condition President Biden's open border creates in communities all across Arizona. They all have different stories to tell, but they all agree that the border has never been as much of a dangerous disaster as it is today. It went from the most secure border in recent history to the most unsecure border in recent history in just a matter of days. And ultimately, only Joe Biden is responsible for that. Before going to our witnesses and recognizing them and swearing them in, I want to give a chance to our host, Congressman Cisco Bonney, who, as I said, has, has become a good friend of this committee, a good friend of all of us, and is doing a great job in the United States Congress trying to address these issues and others. I want to give him a chance to uh, make some introductory remarks. Congressman Cisco Bonney, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, and thank you for choosing our community to come and add uh, more attention to this pressing issue. I want to thank all my colleagues as well in the committee for making the trip down here. For people here that know, um, these members have uh, different districts from around the country, and they uh, leave home to be here and see what's see what's really happening at the the border. And and to the witnesses, of course, thank you so much. So and and the audience as well for making the time. This is an important issue. We've always known that. We have recognized that. And uh, and and of course, our host town, the town of Sauerita, with Mayor Murphy, a good friend and someone that has been steadfast on this issue and supportive as well. It does take all of us to 
highlight the importance of the issue, and that's what we've been doing and working together. The testimonies you'll hear today will highlight something that we know quite well here in southern Arizona, and that's that the border is broken. That's not just a saying. It's not a, a, a random line. We've seen that, and the evidence is there. It's not an opinion. It's a fact, and we can see that with the numbers. And it's having a devastating impact here on a daily basis. The border crisis uh, and any crisis here are not anything new that we haven't seen in this region. But we're experiencing now, it's something that we have never seen before. The numbers, the, 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 the amount, uh, the consequences of it, the, the tragic results of what fentanyl has done uh, to our community is something that we never even imagined. From public safety to trade and commerce as well, to other industries like agriculture, no aspect of life in Arizona is untouched by this border crisis. It's a reality that my constituents live every day, that you all live every day. Our local communities feel abandoned by the federal government, and, and uh, this White House and this administration are paying the price for their inaction, both literally and figuratively. Local hospitals pay out of pocket for medical care for the flow of migration that we're seeing, and counties foot the bill for bus tickets to transport individuals to different areas. And then, of course, we have families here like Ms. Fagan Alexander's and also the Dunn's that I just met today that have lost loved ones to accidental fentanyl poisoning. And ranchers who live on the border, like Mr. Chilton, that we've talked about this several times, are afraid to leave their houses due to cartel <laughs> activity coming through their property. Families like Mr. Chilton's that have been here for generations and what they're seeing now, they've never seen before. And to our witnesses and those watching at home, I want you to know that the colleagues here that I'm joined with today are listening and they're paying attention from all across the country and that they're represented here. They care about this. I know because I work with them every single week and I've become a friend of this committee. In fact, this committee, the Judiciary Committee, it helped pass the bill that I introduced not too long ago and it passed out of the House I may say with bipartisan support, with over 56 Democrats voting for this as well and every single Republican. H.R. 5885, the Agent Raul Gonzalez Officer Safety Act. But if it wasn't for this committee and the leadership in this committee, then we, that bill would have never made it through. But they were able to speed it up and we were able to vote on it. If, you're not, if you don't know this committee, this, this bill deals with high-speed chases and tackling that issue that has become just a constant threat in our communities of cartels recruiting young people from Tucson and from Phoenix to come and drive at high-speed chases and drive migrants up north, endangering not only their lives and the lives of the migrants, but also the lives of innocent bystanders. This is a humanitarian crisis as much as it is a national security crisis as well. Humanitarian for those being trafficked, those women and children being trafficked, and also for our own citizens and communities here that are being abused and are being introduced to this deadly, deadly drug of fentanyl that in many cases the poisoning happens uh, by accident. So I want to thank once again my colleagues for being here and for helping us pass that bill. It's on the Senate now and it's up to the Senate to also take action on it and it's up to this White House to take action. So again, thank you to my colleagues for being here. Thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity to uh, wave in and to be able to participate in today. And with that, sir, I yield back. And thank you for your leadership on this issue and so many others. Um, uh, we will now introduce our, our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Chris Clem retired from a 27-year career in the United States Border Patrol as the chief patrol agent in the Yuma sector in December of 2022. He served the bulk of that career on the southwest U.S. border, but also spent time in leadership positions at Border Patrol headquarters in Washington, D.C. Mr. Clem earned a uh, Master of Science in Management and Leadership in Criminal Justice and a B.S. in Criminal Justice from Sam Houston State University and a Certificate of Graduation for Senior Managers in Government from the Harvard Kennedy School. Mr. Clem, thank you for your service and thank you for being here today. Mr. Jim Chilton, as, as uh, Congressman Cisco Monday mentioned, is a fifth-generation Arizona rancher who founded the Chilton Ranch and Cattle Company with his father and brother in 1979. Not only is Mr. Chilton an accomplished rancher and businessman, but he also served as a special assistant to the U.S. Senator from Arizona. Mr. Chilton earned a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Economics and a Master of Arts in Political Science from Arizona State University. Again, Mr. Chilton, thank you for your service and for being here. Mr. Jacob Karchner recently retired as a detective from the Cochise County Sheriff's Department after a 20-year career. During that time, Detective Karchner 
served on the department's ranch patrol and was a founding member of the Sabra unit, which worked closely with landowners to strategically place cameras on borderlands to catch human and drug smugglers, as well as other criminals crossing the border. Mr. Karcher uh, is also a rancher whose family has owned land in Cochise County since 1891. Thank you as well. And Mrs. Jill Fagan Alexandra. Uh, Alexandra is a wife and mother of nine children. She's an accomplished writer, publisher, and speaker. Went back to school while she was in her 40s to become a labor and delivery nurse. Based on her family's experience, Ms. Fagan Alexander is now on a mission to promote awareness of the fentanyl crisis and how Arizona kids and families can protect themselves from being fentanyl victims. We thank you for being here and sharing your important story and for all your work. We welcome our witnesses and thank them for appearing today. We will begin by swearing you in. Would you please raise, uh, please rise, excuse me, and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record uh, reflect that all uh, witnesses have answered in the affirmative. You can be seated. Thank you so much. Uh, please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes, but we'll be, we'll be fine. We'll, we'll give you a little extra. If you need a little extra, that's, it. that's up to you. And we're going to just go right down the list, just like we introduced you, and we'll finish with Ms. Fagan Alexander. But let's start with Mr. Clem. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Chris Clem. I am a retired Chief Patrol Agent of the U.S. Border Patrol. I began my career in 1995, about 150 miles east of here in Lordsburg, New Mexico, as a GS-5 Border Patrol trainee, and retired nearly 17 months ago, about 250 miles west of here, as a Senior Executive Service Chief Patrol Agent in Yuma, Arizona. Therefore, my responses to your questions will be based on my recollection of my experiences over the last now 28 plus years. I spent most of my career along the southwest border, and I spent a few years in Washington, D.C. and New Orleans, Louisiana. I was a career government employee who served under five presidential administrations, under, uh, starting under Clinton and ending under Biden. I was not a political appointee. I promoted through the ranks through competitive process and commanded four Border Patrol stations across New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. I served as the Deputy Chief Patrol Agent in New Orleans Sector, El Paso Sector, was acting chief in Big Bend, Texas for nearly six months before being promoted to Chief Patrol Agent of the Yuma, Arizona Sector for two years until my retirement. I spent time as an agent in remote locations as well as urban environments. And I can tell you, if you've been to one station, you have been to one station. If you've been to one sector, you have been to one sector. Each location is different with its own set of unique circumstances from terrain to infrastructure to communities and to threats. However, the one thing that is consistent across the spectrum, without border security, our agents, our community, the migrants, and our country are vulnerable. While immigration and border security are closely related, they are not mutually exclusive. However, without proper border security in the form of physical security, border patrol agents, strong policies and consequences, the integrity of the immigration system is compromised and the founding principles surrounding the rule of law suffer. My statement testimony today will be focused on border security, to which I would be considered a subject matter expert. Immigration, as mentioned, is related but can only be effective and efficient when the border is secured. It is also my testimony that each administration that I served under made efforts to secure our border based on the requirements of border patrol agents except the Biden administration. Under President Clinton, a hiring push for more agents began. I was one of them. Under President Bush and the result of the tragedy of September 11, 2001, infrastructure plans and one of the first national border patrol strategies were implemented. Even under President Obama, Obama there were hundreds of miles of border wall constructed, especially early in his terms. We also know that build a wall was a fixture of candidate Trump campaign, but became a reality under President Trump. Let me be clear. President Trump implemented requirements, which were a culmination of decades of experience from Border Patrol agents. The wall was much more than a wall. It was a system to include wall, technology, access road, and even strong policies to close loopholes. I will state that the system in place in 2020 was one of the best we could have asked for as a country, even with party politics and funding making things difficult. This ended and came to a screeching halt under President Biden. At the end of fiscal year 2020, Yuma sector had just uh, over 8,800 arrests. That number leaped to over 114,000 in fiscal year 2021 and over 312,000 in fiscal year 22. This committee and Congress have access to all the available data and the staunch difference between the previous administration and the current is gut-riching and jaw-dropping. I understand that every threat to our great nation will come directly across the border, but why would we be willing to risk it? 
We know there are countless gaps and vulnerabilities created along the border, specifically the southern border. We are on the heels of two recent testimonies from FBI Director Ray that indicate the threats are real. With hotspots around the world that have happened under President Biden's administration, there are more than enough reasons to secure our border and put back in place the plan as intended to include infrastructure, technology, and policies. We need the wall installed and completed where it makes sense. We need technology installed as intended, and we need to increase the number of border patrol agents and border security personnel as requested by senior field leaders. Lastly, I want to thank you for holding a field hearing. I've been advocating for more field hearings so we the people can meet you and feel represented. While it's difficult to pull off, it's essential for Americans to be truly represented. I understand many will claim this is a political stunt, and I would counter by stating talking about the hearing and not acting on behalf of the community so greatly impacted by this border crisis is the political stunt. I'm grateful for your willingness to come to the border again to hear from those that have lived it and are living it today. My full and complete statement has been submitted. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Clem, and I would I disagree with you. It is anything but a political stunt. There's a reason we have Mr. Crane, Mr. Biggs, Mr. Siskamani from your great state here and others from around the country. We have the chairman of the Immigration Subcommittee from California, Mr. McClintock, here. Wish we had some Democrats that would actually show up uh, because it's not a stunt. It's about dealing with a real problem and doing everything we can to highlight how serious it is. So thank you for your testimony. Mr. Chilton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Honorable uh, Congressman. Uh, my name is Jim Chilton. I'm a fifth generation Arizona rancher uh, from the small town of Aravaca, southwest of Tucson. Uh, the ranch includes private properties, state school trust lands, and federal grazing permits. My ancestors drove cattle from Texas to Arizona in uh, 139 years ago. This, do I see a map here? Oh, you're right. This map of our 50,000, uh, the southern end of the, our ranch is the international boundary for about five and one half miles. The black lines are our ranch boundaries. The blue lines is the international border with Mexico, and the red line is the Ruby Road. Wall construction was stopped uh, on our ranch by President Biden on January 20, 2021, with a half a mile left to go on our ranch, and there were additional gaps all along the wall. For about 10 years, I have collected film from hidden motion-activated cameras of drug packers, previously deported persons, criminals, and other persons not seeking asylum and crossing north through our ranch. Of approximately 100 trails on our ranch, only five have cameras. I have images now of over 3,050 uh, people coming through the ranch marching north. Uh, are any of these 3,050 terrorists? This is a national security issue. I simultaneously the cartel is rooting massive numbers of asylum seekers uh, through the end of the wall on our ranch and a gap uh, in California Gulch. Last month, that's April, approximately 5,460 of these undocumented persons were apprehended, processed, and released. They are wearing street clothes and seeking the border patrol and appear to come from all different parts of the world. The amount of trash and human waste left by these people is appalling. The failure to secure the border allows border crosser deaths. We've had three deaths on our ranch in 2023, and I estimate 
35 deaths on our ranch uh, since 1987. The cartel scouts occupy our mountains and they facilitate flooding drugs into our country. They including is the fact that their devastating crosser caused fires and some causes substantial environmental damage. Part of the solution is to complete the construction of the wall, including fiber optic cable, electronics, cameras, and sensors. I believe in legal immigration, not illegal immigration. We are a nation of immigrants, and they do great things for our country. Bottom line, everybody should be legal. My thought is, is we need to expand the number of people legally coming into the country and securing our border. Right now, it's open, and it's President Biden's fault. Thank you. Well said. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chilton. Mr. Karcher, you're recognized. And just, yeah, pull that microphone nice and close. Go right ahead. Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak today and for your willingness to come here and identify where the problem lies. I'm a fifth generation resident of Cochise County with both sides of my family ranching and raising families here for over 100 years. I'm a rancher within the border region and recently retired law enforcement. Over my lifetime in Cochise County and my tenure with the Cochise County Sheriff's Office, I've seen ebbs and flows of illegal immigration and the effects that it has on those of us that live in rural Arizona. This is the worst I've ever seen. Growing up, there were always those wanting to come to America for a better life, the American dream, as it were. Those folks would pass through, maybe stop and ask for water or food and be on their way. Then larger groups started coming through, cutting holes in fences, draining water tanks, leaving trails of trash in their wake, and in some cases, succumbing to the elements. I've ranched throughout Cochise County and felt first, dealt firsthand with the border-related issues. The environmental impact caused by millions of people coming through have devastated ranch lands in Cochise County, making it more difficult for ranching families to continue their legacy and heritage. Several multi-generational ranches in Cochise County have sold over the last decade to large corporations or absentee owners, in part, if not all, due to the increasing pressure felt by the ongoing border crisis. Cochise County has been on the front lines of this de crisis for decades, and I've had the privilege of serving those who are affected on a daily basis. Cochise County citizens and ranchers. During the last 10 years of my career, I was part of the Ranch Patrol and Sabre team, which consisted of a handful of guys dedicated to, de to identifying the threats from international smuggling organizations and doing everything we could to stop them. Sabre stands for the uh, Southern Arizona Border Region Enforcement Team, and it's a collaborative effort with other law enforcement partners, live feed game cameras set up in the rural areas between the ports of entry to detect illegal activity. Prior to 2020, the border issues in Cochise County were what we referred to as controlled chaos, in that law enforcement agencies working together were able to respond and address issues as they were detected. The traffic here and the majority of Southern Arizona is not give up or asylum seekers, as seen on the limited media coverage. What comes across the Arizona desert are generally males, 18 to 40, wearing camouflage from head to toe including wearing carpet over their shoes so to make it harder to detect and track them. Since 2021, the, de the detected flow of military-aged males um, that, that's been detected on the SABRE program has increased over tenfold from the years prior. In drug smuggling or events where the state crime was committed, deputies would take disposition on the cases. But in cases involving Im illegal immigration, Coordination was made with the corresponding Border Patrol stations for the apprehensions. Of all the suspected illegal entries documented by the SABRE program since its inception, less than 35% of all detections were apprehended and identified. Since 2021, 
when I would encounter these individuals, our conversations would turn to where they're going, where they come from, or why. Um, they, they would always tell me about these commercials that they would see uh, in their home countries, and they would, there would be people on the TV telling them, come to Oregon, come to New York, come to Chicago. Uh, there's a job waiting for you, no questions asked. The, the destination and the, uh, the, the job that they were seeking weren't always the same, but multiple times, I mean, these, these commercials would always come up, so... Uh, they would also tell me that it was costing them anywhere between six thousand and eight thousand dollars, sometimes more, uh, that they had to pay the cartel in order to cross. Most of the people that I had contact with didn't have that kind of money to pay the cartel, telling me they would owe that amount to the cartel once they reached their final destination, wherever that may be. As the traffic increased, so did the need for transportation of the cartel's chattel, and I call them chattel because they they at that point are property of the cartel. The cartels use social media platforms to recruit drivers to pick these folks up and transport them to larger transportation hubs such as Tucson or Phoenix. These load drivers, as they're called, are told by their handlers where to go and when to run from law enforcement. These drivers come from all walks of life, ranging in age from 13 to over 70, drug addicts to suburban grandmothers, but all have one thing in common. They all work for transnational human trafficking organizations. Offers to pay cash money for drivers entice people from all over the country to come to southern Arizona and transport illegal aliens to further the cartel's operation. This operation comes at a cost for residents in Cochise County with over a dozen deaths from high-speed collisions over the last couple of years, all tied to human smuggling events. Am I okay? Okay. These incidents have become so commonplace that even when a light turns green, residents of Cochise County wait to see if a high-speed load driver is going to run the red light before proceeding into the intersection. When one of these load drivers does stop or evade law enforcement, a common response is for every occupant of the vehicle to run in a different direction, lessening the chance of capture. This puts not only criminals already fleeing from law enforcement onto our ranches and our, into our neighborhoods, but also unknown aliens who are literally in a foreign country who will do anything to avoid capture and have to try and find a way to survive. Again, thank you for being here and allowing me to speak, but as of today, we as a country have no control nor knowledge of who or what is coming across our border. Our southern border is being controlled by the cartels, and we need to find a way to regain that control. We have happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Karcher, and it uh, again underscores why Mr. Uh, Siskamani's legislation on the high-speed chases is so so important. Uh, Ms. Fagan Alexander, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Jordan, other members of Congress, thank Hold you. Hold that so real much. close there. Thank we you. Want to hear you, Chairman Jordan, and other members of Congress, thank you for coming to Arizona to hear one perspective of how the open border is impacting families in Arizona. I recently lost two of my boys just three weeks apart due to the fentanyl crisis in Arizona. My 20-year-old Sam had been in and out of detention since he was 14 years old, mostly for alcohol-related incidents. He typically stayed away from hard drugs, but at 17, he went to prison for a year for a crime he committed while he was high on meth. When he got out, he was excited to stay clean. He wouldn't even take his ADD meds because he was worried he might abuse them. Over the next year, he worked hard at setting up a new life. He found a girlfriend and got a job, a car, and an apartment. He seemed to be doing well for a while, but then it all began to fall apart. His girlfriend moved out because he started using again, and not just pot or meth. He was buying fentanyl because it was cheap, potent, and easy to find. He lost his job, and on April 6, 2023, while he was high, he got arrested. On intake, he was honest about his drug use. Deputies discovered he also had COVID, so they put him in isolation, which, together with coming down from fentanyl, put him at greater risk for self-harm. Experiencing the effects of COVID and fentanyl withdrawal, Sam reported intense muscle and bone pain, chills, sweats, uncontrollable shaking and vomiting, and he decided to end his life by hanging himself in jail. It wasn't until days later that his dad and I were notified and eventually allowed to see him while he was on life support, waiting for a determination of brain death. Even though Sam had quite often made poor choices, he was a good person and he had a good heart. When he got his driver's license after getting out of prison, he chose to be an organ donor. Our family honors his wish and on April 16th, Sam was able to donate his best kidney to his 30-year-old cousin who was on dialysis due to pharmaceutical kidney failure and for whom our family had been praying for months would find a donor. 
Sam's other kidney and pancreas were gifted to a woman in her 30s, his liver to a man in his 40s, and his heart, by strange coincidence or by miracle, was gifted to the adopted son of my cousin's friend, who was near death due to congenital heart complications. As my family tried to move forward from this tragic experience, we all suffered from grief to varying degrees. Every time one of my kids left the house, I was sure I was going to get a call that they had been killed. My constant thoughts and prayers were, the, for, were for their safety. We went to clean out Sam's apartment, and I took out all the paraphernalia I found before letting the kids in. I th threatened them not to bring anything home that they shouldn't, but I let them each pick a few things of Sam's that they wanted. A Dolly Parton shirt, a Village Inn baseball cap, a llama planting cup, and a cup that says, strangely, mountains above the rest, Dad, became some of our newfound favorite possessions. My 18-year-old son floundered in his last semester of schooling, as did his 16-year-old brother. Gabe, my 13-year-old, ended up getting suspended for forgetfully bringing one of Sam's pocket knives to school in his jacket. I couldn't believe it, but I also couldn't blame him. My 11-year-old daughter became my constant shadow, unwilling to be too far away from me for any amount of time. None of us could think straight. We were all wrapped in a fog of loss and sadness. During the week that Gabe was suspended at home, he decided to a change was in order for his schooling. He picked out some online classes and was excited. As only a 13-year-old can, he confidently told us of his plans to finish high school in just one year and to take over the world. On Wednesday, May 3rd, just two and a half weeks after, after Sam's honor walk and organ donation, Gabe was found unresponsive with no pulse or respirations, and he was blue in the face. Gabe had never shown signs of drug use. I have no knowledge that he was a regular user of any substance. We found out later that he had a pill found at Sam's house, and we surmised that he took it that day. I think he thought it would be fun to see what it was like to get high on Oxy. When he said he wasn't feeling well and threw up, I think he realized he was in danger, and he was reaching out for help. I think after he showered and said he was going to take a nap, he thought he was out of the woods. I think he thought he was going to wake up that day, but he never woke up again. Valiant attempts were made by his dad, sheriff's officers, first responders, and medical staff to save him, but that night we were given the news that Gabe had also suffered an oxic brain injury due to respiratory failure caused by fentanyl poisoning. Through another nightmarish week in the ICU, we decided to give the gift of life again through organ donation. I cannot describe the grief and pain we personally experienced, nor the shock of the organ donor, donor network coordinators as we met again and made arrangements for Gabe's gifts. Another honor walk was done, and on May 9th, 2023, one year ago yesterday, Gabe was able to impact seven lives and families by gifting his kidneys to two men in their 70s, his liver to a 15-year-old boy, and two of his heart valves and his cornea to others. I never set out to be an influencer, a politician, or a firebrand for change, but the things I learned after my boys were, in essence, murdered by fentanyl dealers, both shocked and angered me into action. Gabe's pill was not unique. The DEA states that seven out of 10 pills they've seized and tested have more than a lethal dose of fentanyl. The, Gabe, the pill that Gabe took that ended his life had more than five times the lethal dose of fentanyl. Everyone knows the, t the statistics on fentanyl deaths, but no one believes it will happen to them, just like I didn't. Did my boys play a part in their own deaths? Absolutely. They made their choices, and our family has to live with them. But this virtual flood of pills both into and through Arizona, which has dramatically worsened under the current administration, allowed my boys to make choices they may not have without the current open border crisis. Nothing now will stop me from teaching kids that one pill one time can kill, from educating parents that Narcan at home saves lives, and from trying to close the border while stiffening penalties for those producing, importing, and selling fentanyl in our country, knowing that every pill that comes into Arizona in this border crisis is likely a death sentence for another child like mine or yours. I am asking our government to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Said as only a mom can say it, so we, we, we appreciate you being here and, and for your testimony. 
Um, chair now recognizes the chairman of the subcommittee on, on immigration, uh, Mr. McClintock from California. Well, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, Mr. Clem, during a visit with Border Patrol agents last year in Yuma, uh, I reminded them Congress has no power to enforce the law. Uh, our role is to write the laws, and I asked them what laws they needed us to write to, to, to be able to better do their jobs. And they answered unanimously, we don't need new laws, we need to enforce the laws we already have. Obviously we can and, and, and we have written laws to make it easier for future presidents to secure the border as Donald Trump did, make it harder for them to open the border as, uh, as Biden has done. But is this still mainly a question of enforcement? Yes, sir, I would agree with that. The laws and the books that have been written of over the last uh, decades um, allow us to do our job. It is the policy and the direction coming out of the executive branch that uh, can, you know, directs how we're going to do things. 8 U.S.C. 1325 clearly says if you cross the border outside of a port of injury, it is against the law, regardless of your intent. And so, yeah, I don't believe we need new laws. I think we just need new leadership and direction to uh, uh, encourage us to continue to enforce the laws. Now, as I recall, on Inauguration Day, our borders were pretty much secure. Uh, the Remain in Mexico policy of the Trump administration had slowed phony asylum claims to a trickle. The border wall was nearing completion. We were actually enforcing court-ordered deportations, returning illegals to their own communities, uh, where word got out very quickly, it's not worth paying the cartels thousands of dollars because you're just going to end up back here. Um, uh, the laws didn't change on Inauguration Day. The presidency did. And on that first day, uh, Joe Biden rescinded the executive orders that, uh, that, that Trump had issued to enforce our laws. What differences did you see on the ground between uh, uh, the, the days before the inauguration and the days we're seeing today? I can tell you that in October of 2020, uh, Yuma sector averaged where I was going to be uh, 25 arrests a day. It went up in November to 34 a day, up to about 54 a day in December, 119 in January, and by May of 2021, it went up to over 500 a day. And as I mentioned in my opening statement, we went from 8,800 arrests in 2000. 2020 in Yuma to 114,000 in 21 to 312,000 in 22. So that is a direct result of the executive orders that pretty much undermined and undid everything that we had worked towards uh, over a culmination and, of several years. And on years. the ground, as a law enforcement officer, what change did you have in the orders you received from, from on high when the administration changed? It wasn't so much of any direct orders to stop doing it or doing anything. It was just the fact that the floodgates had been opened. When you are dealing with a um, thousand arrests a day and you only have a couple hundred border patrol agents working in a 24-hour cycle, it quickly adds up and it ties our hands. Our agents were were pretty much uh, uh, relegated to process transportation and processing and. And getting people processed and out as quickly as possible. Current that was law, really much the kind of the direction we were we were heading. Current law requires that asylum claims be detained until their claims resolved. The Trump administration implemented the Remain in Mexico policy and a safe third co uh, countries policy that allowed claimants to remain free in those countries while their claims were being heard. What was the effect of this policy on the number of illegals claiming asylum that you encountered, and was the rescinding of this policy by Biden largely responsible for the influx that you, you just described? Yeah, I have no doubt in my mind that the rescission of the microprotection protocol led to the, the mass incursions we, we started seeing. I want to make something very clear. Uh, majority, and I would say an overwhelming majority, I don't recall people in my custody actually seeking asylum. It was through the removal process, while we were processing them, did they claim fear, which offers them an asylum asylum hearing. And they're all trained to Right, do they're that. trained. And these are all folks that are not seeking asylum. They are using it as a defense. But when you end the microprotection protocol, which basically was closing the loopholes, uh, that word got out so quickly that if you make it, you get to stay and ultimately put us back in a catch and release mindset. Mr. Karchner, what have you seen in Cochise County with respect to criminal cartels and affiliated gangs? Are, are they now operating here in American communities? 
And what's that mean for the safety of our neighborhoods? As far as the uh, the, the criminal cartels, uh, as as in my statement, the criminal cartel or the, the Mexican cartels control the border, and and they control that from both sides of the line. Have they now permeated into our country? The the majority of uh, of what I've seen uh, through investigations and everything else, there are there are players within the Phoenix area, within the Tucson area, that's where the coordination for for these load drivers comes from, is from people that are already in the U.S. Not Well, a, a local law enforcement in my uh, uh, community in California told me of, of one of the nearby rural towns that became a place where MS-13 brought its victims from Los Angeles to murder. And there are absolutely gruesome stories of faces being carved off, of fingers severed <coughs> digit by digit. Can we expect this sort of violence to proliferate here as MS-13 and, and other violent gangs establish stronger footholds in our communities? I, I can speak to, to what I've seen here in Cochise County, and Cochise County is not where people are staying. The, the cartels do operate there, but there we're simply a pass-through. Um, further out in the, in the country, in Ohio, in, in California, in, in New York, that's where I, I believe that you're going to see probably some of that, that cartel. And that's why Border Patrol agents have been warning us for, for years to warn our communities uh, outside of the, uh, of the international boundary uh, that uh, every community is becoming a border town. Yes, correct. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona who's been working on this issue uh, nonstop, uh, uh, Congressman Biggs, is recognized. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for bringing this hearing here. <clears throat> and thank you to our witnesses who have given us amazing testimony. We appreciate you being here. Thank you for the audience for being here, the, the uh, uh, police presence, and, and uh, uh, Mayor Murphy, thank you, and the, the town of Sarita. And then I see at the back of the room my old friend from the State Senate, Frank Antonori, and I would just advise the, the police, you might want to haul that guy out right now, <laughs> just, uh, just saying. So, so earlier this week, we had uh, a briefing, some of us did, with, with uh, Chief Maudlin, who is the chief, sector chief for this sector, the Tucson sector. And I want to give you some startling figures. So from 2018 to 2020, uh, it, the, the, appra the encounters averaged 60,000 a year in this sector, in Tucson sector. They have been higher in 19 for sure. In 2021, that number was 190,000, 190,000 encounters in 2021. In 2022, it was 250,000 encounters. In 2023, it was 373 encounters. And year to date, it exceeds 350,000, and they, are in, they, they anticipate that they will exceed 700,000 encounters in the Tucson sector by the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30th. And I'm not counting or including um, Godaways, both known and unknown. And I'm not figuring into the fact that uh, CBP has now changed how you count known and unknown Godaways, which actually will impact how you, you count them. So I want to reiterate, Chief, uh, you told us at the time, and, and, but, and you've now testified twice, but i got to get this. Yuma sector, you were the chief, 2020, what was the total annual count? It was just over 8,800 arrests in 2020. Right. And then it went up to 114,000 to end the fiscal year 21. And, and when we look at it, they're averaging somewhere north of 350 a day in Yuma still. That's what I've been told. That's the report. What is that? What does that do to a community? So let, let's just take Yuma for one second to go from 8,800 encounters. We know, and I've been there. I saw it when it was just overcrowded and booming. What happens to a community like Yuma who has one hospital and you have all those people coming in? And you're having to release it because you have no place to put them. And no, neither does any place else on the southwest border. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's very important for people to realize that um, even if one geographic location is getting hard, hit very hard like Yuma did, others are suffering as well. Um, we take care of each other along the way. Uh, 
in a place like Yuma, majority of the year, there's only about 100,000 residents. Uh, they, there's a lot of winter visitors that come down there and, and add to, uh, to the community. But when you arrest over 100,000 people uh, that matches and exceeds the community, uh, it becomes a problem. Uh, there's only one food bank. There was only one large non-government organization that was capable of handling that. And uh, there's only one hospital. And so it took an entire community to rally around the Border Patrol. And thank goodness they did, because we were already overwhelmed, sitting on average of five to 6,000 people a day that we would have to release. The NGO would take them and help us so we weren't releasing them to the street, because there's no bus station. There's one airport that people can, you know, can fly to Phoenix out of, but it was very difficult. So thank goodness the NGO stepped up. But so did the entire community. The, uh, the hospital, my understanding is there's still 20 to $30 million in unpaid bills mm -hmm. from migrants that were That's showing right. up directly because we could not get out there and respond quick enough. And there were times that the ER was filled with illegal aliens. The maternity ward was filled with illegal aliens. So really, really impacted the community. You had farmers that had to plow under fields um, because they, uh, they'd been contaminated. Now, Mr. Chilton, uh, at the edge of your your branch, um, where the fencing ends, not too far away, just a couple miles, is a um, I don't know how to I don't know how to describe it an encampment that's being run. It's, it's highly I've been there. It's unsanitary. <clears throat> it's unsanitary. It's it's they're rolling rolling people through there. How many people have come around that edge of your ranch and filtered through there? According to one Border Patrol officer, 5,640 people uh, have come uh, around the end of the wall on our ranch and through California Gulch, which is a huge gap. And they walk to the west uh, to this migrant camp that you spoke of. 5,640 people in April alone. And they're moving people out, just so you understand. Now, there's, there might be 100, 150 there, and then Border Patrol will get to them, and they'll take them out, and then it's immediately filled back up, that encampment. You're so, correct. So I've uh, talked to Border Patrol officers, and they've said, uh, we used to be a security force, and now we're just glorified taxi drivers. So... Um, Thank, thanks for that, Mr. Chilton. And then, uh, Mr. Karchner, um, the high-speed chases and the saber uh, force, I, I mean, we could talk about what Sheriff Daniels has done in Cochise County and how he's really tried to um, uh, secure that county quite a bit. Tell us a little bit about the impact of the high-speed chases through the town of Sierra Vista. And then while you're thinking about that, I'll just tell you that I was down there once and, it, and we had, the high-speed chase had just ended in a, a fatal accident. So please tell us. As I stated in my statement, uh, over a dozen uh, deaths have, have occurred directly tied to these uh, immigration or uh, high-speed chases coming through. Um, the, the sheriff has done a, a fabulous job of, of utilizing what resources we have to try and address it. We've, we've brought in law enforcement partners from uh, different parts of the state to, to help out with that. Um, but they, they continue to happen as long as the cartel is going to continue to recruit these people. And, and like I said, anywhere from age 13 is, is the youngest that we've had took mom's car from Phoenix and, and drove down to, to Cochise County to pick up however many unknowns to uh, people, people, kids who can't even, don't know how to drive. Correct. And they're told to not stop, and just, uh, just go fast and keep going. One, one, one particular 17-year-old driver um, told us that, that yeah, he was, he was just playing a, a real-life game of Grand Theft Auto. He was, he was playing a video game with people's lives. Well, and, and our heart goes, thank you, Mrs. Alexander, for your testimony. And I'll just tell you that um, when you start talking about recruitment, you're recruiting at
um, low, at high schools. There's, they're recruiting on Snapchat, uh, Instagram, and they're, they're giving you specific loadout places. Go to mile marker X on maybe it's the I-8 corridor or some, wherever else it may be, and there's where you're going to meet somebody, and you're going to transport them, and you're going to make 1000 per head or something like that. And, and to a young person, it's going to be incredibly enticing to, to get involved in that. So uh, my time is way, way expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for all being here today. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Benz, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank all of you for being here today, sharing your stories with us. Uh, my family is a ranching family up in Oregon. Granddad came out of Texas 110 years ago. The ranches of my three of my little brothers have ranches of similar size to yours, Mr. Children. And uh, I cannot imagine having thousands upon thousands of people traipsing through and across uh, our permits and, and our land. I cannot imagine the damage that, that would do to your to, to your operations, your watering facilities, your fences, your ability to keep cattle in the proper place. Uh, I was looking at the fences uh, that uh, Mr. Biggs called out on your map, and I, I, I truly cannot imagine. I will tell you that the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service up in Oregon, uh, where I'm from, uh, are very, very intent upon making sure that, in, that, that we don't go off trails, that we don't uh, man, you know, damage the yeah. land in any fact. I assume they must be down clattering around your ranch to make sure that your property is protected from all these people <laughs> traipsing across it. Is that correct? The BLM is making a huge play, I'm sure, to try to keep all these uh, folks from coming across your land. Is that correct? The Forest Service, where I have three permits, uh, does a remarkably good job of trying. However, it's impossible. Uh, the 3,050 people I have images of coming across uh, do great damage, and the 5,640 people at the end of the ranch going towards that migrant camp uh, just leave tons of trash. Uh, sometimes our cows eat the trash or plastic and die. I'm, I'm, I'm being facetious. The point is that we have these federal agencies that should be focusing exactly on your problem because it's so broad in scope and, and it's, it's, it's really sad to see. I, I, I want to, Ms. Fagan, first of all, thank you so much for, for having the courage to, to be here today and, and sharing uh, the almost impossible situation with us. We are now awash in fentanyl. We are literally awash in this stuff. And so your, the value of what you're doing to try to warn people of this incredible danger is, is, un, is unbelievable. Are you talking to young people and others? How are you trying to, uh, because the odds of us going around and scooping this up, uh, the odds of us finally convincing the Biden administration to do something about the border are remote. But your ability to try to go in and, and try to at least, at least warn kids, so how is that going? I had the opportunity on September 11th of 2023 to go and speak to my son's school, so his classmates and peers, as well as their parents. Um, that was a unique opportunity. It was very challenging, but I also made sure to tell kids, you can't take anything. You can't take medicine from your friends. You can't take anything from anyone that didn't come from your parents or from the school nurse. Nothing is safe, not because your friends are trying to poison you, but because who knows where it all has been. I talk to parents all the time to tell them, you can give Narcan to your child. If you find a child unresponsive, you can give Narcan. It's not going to hurt them if they haven't had opioids. You can give it every two minutes until EMS arrives. If that had been done for my son, he would be alive. There were signs that he was having respiratory distress, which is the biggest factor in fentanyl poisoning, respiratory distress. It was seen in him, but his, his dad didn't know what to do. I want that message to get out to parents so that when our kids make these stupid choices, like at 13, they're going to go and traffic people. Our kids are going to make mistakes. We need to be parents that they can come to when they have made that bad decision and they can be safe with us so that we can save them from themselves. Are, are, have you found others that are helping you in this effort? 
Absolutely. I've coordinated with other uh, mostly family-driven organizations that are trying to get the message out about fentanyl and about all of the impacts that these are having on our children. I would look for more opportunities to do that. I would do anything I could to save one family <coughs> from experiencing what we have. Well, I really, really appreciate your being here, and, and thank, you, thank you for your efforts. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, thank you. Um, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Fitzgerald, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thanks for uh, bringing the committee uh, to Arizona, and thanks to Congressman Siskamani for hosting us. Appreciate it. Um, I wanted to. Uh, I, I want to thank Mrs. Alexander for for coming and and telling her story. It's uh, obviously heart wrenching. And unfortunately, uh, like Congressman Bent said, um, we're, we all have stories now from our congressional districts of families that have suffered uh, the same tragedy that, that you've gone through, uh, which, which means, you know, even though we're here today taking testimony in Arizona, this is something that has affected um, everyone throughout the entire country at this point. Um, so along with that, uh, Congressman Biggs and I were able to make a quick trip down to the border and meet with the Border Patrol uh, this morning. And one of the most alarming things, I think, was the confirmation that we got from them that they've had contacts now with uh, Chinese nationals. Um, maybe not in the same numbers that you see in some of the other sectors, but, but in fact, it's, it's really happening. Um, and, and, you know, any of us that have any contact with the Foreign Affairs Committee or if you have been on some of these visits uh, internationally, uh, this is a threat that's way beyond what any of us could have imagined even a year ago. Um, but I want to go back to Mr. Clem, if I could. One of the things I've worked on, and I think because this has an effect kind of, again, nationally, is uh, in a priority has been uh, that we still don't we still haven't permanently designated fentanyl as a Schedule One substance, which is just amazing to me. And you know it, it's not because we haven't tried. We've authored bills. I've off, authored bills to to try and and underscore the seriousness of this. And unfortunately, we still have an administration right now that is more worried about legalizing marijuana than scheduling, than making fentanyl a Schedule One. Can, can you talk a little bit about, uh, do you think that would have an effect on law enforcement and how they approach the issues and the problems that we have related to fentanyl and how it's coming across the border right now? I think any time you take a serious approach on something that is causing such devastation like fentanyl poisoning across this country and you prioritize it and you make it something like a schedule one and that's going to give a, a, a boost to the morale to law enforcement because they know that that's going to lead to a successful prosecution and is an opportunity to at least mitigate the threat that it poses um, I think they got the priorities mixed up uh, as far as working on legalizing one while they're not criminalizing one at the highest level I think that uh, we need to make that a Schedule One, and we need to hold uh, source countries and pass-through countries accountable for that because, <clears throat> look, uh, unfortunately, if a, uh, I hate using this as an example, but if a, if a plane crashed every day and 300 people died, they would make a big deal about that. That's the number of people that are dying every day, according to statistics, to fentanyl poisoning. We need to prioritize that. We need to shut it down where it's coming from. We need to help the Border Patrol agents and the officers at the ports to help shut it down. So one other thing I'd just like you to comment on, if you could, because this is really happening right now. Some of my Democrat colleagues are suggesting that the majority of fentanyl is coming through the U.S. in the ports of entry. Can you, can you, con I mean, to me, it makes no sense, and I think to most people, but it's something, it's a narrative yeah. that's being driven right now in D.C. Well, there are there's some there's some truth to that statement because I can tell you that I believe it was in 2022, at least in the state of Arizona, um, about 52 percent of the fentanyl seized was at the ports of entry. What meant the 48 percent was outside the port, but that's what's being seized. 
Uh, we don't know yeah. where the majority of it is coming through because as we've mentioned uh, and has been talked about already, the number of people that are coming in and in getting away, we don't know who they are and what they may be bringing in. So there is some truth to the fact that uh, a lot is being seized at the ports of entry, but uh, it's almost hard to determine where it's, uh, how much is coming through where because we don't know a lot of the unknown factors. But we do know that fentanyl is one of the things that is hitting every community in the United States. The migrants are passing through the border states, but the fentanyl is going everywhere to include border communities. Thank you. And if I could just, uh, Mr. Karchner, I just wanted to, because of your years uh, serving as uh, a deputy, sheriff's deputy, you understand and you know the communities in and around the county. And um, what, what I've been experiencing in my district are uh, some of the municipalities have been just overwhelmed with this sudden influx of illegals into their community. Uh, I have a, a city, the city of Whitewater in Wisconsin, who had uh, 200 non-English speaking students show up on the first day for school. and. Uh, you know, I've talked to the school board president there, and they're like, we're, we're unequipped, we're, we're ill-equipped to handle this. Uh, and then if you talk to the chief of police and to law enforcement there, you know, what becomes uh, a fender bender in the parking lot is a much bigger issue when you've got one person that's, that does not speak any English. And uh, it, the, uh, the amount of, of resources are, are being depleted at a much more rapid pace as a result of of the level of immigration that's happening in our communities. Can you just comment on that? And is that something you saw in in the communities that you work in and around? Uh, I think I, I'd stated it before. We Cochise County, Southern Arizona, uh, we take the brunt of it, kind of liken it to the the front door. Um, when you walk into a house, you you don't stand in the front door. You walk through the front door. The floor gets dirty. We, we end up with some of those problems, but the destination is not here. The destination is, is where you're at, um, where, where throughout the country. Uh, we, we would do tours for, for sheriffs that wanted to, to learn where, okay, this is where the fentanyls come from. This is where, where the, the, the drugs are coming from. This is where the illegal immigration starts. So they would come down, and, and the sheriff, our, our sheriff there in Cochise County, has a program called Borders to Backyards. And so the, these sheriffs would come down, and they would, they would see what's going on. And I had a sheriff actually from Ohio that, that rode with me, and, and we were dealing with these vehicle loads. And, and we pulled one over. There was 11 people stacked up in the bed of a pickup. You know, and, and he actually was able to see it. He went back to Ohio. Two days later, he sends me a picture and had something very similar on the Ohio Turnpike. So it, it takes that realization of where it's coming from. We're, we're so callous to it. We're so used to seeing this that it makes a bigger impact when, when you realize, you know, where it's going. My time's up, Mr. Chairman, but thank you all for being here today. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. <clears throat> Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Crane, another one of our new great members from, from this state. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to wave on to this committee. Thank you to my colleague, uh, Mr. Siskamani, for hosting this in his district. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing us to have this here. Thank you, everybody in attendance, and uh, thank you to the panel for showing up today. I'm going to read you guys a uh, quote. I want to see if you guys know where this comes from. We're a nation who says, if you want to flee and you're fleeing oppression, you should come. Anybody know who said that? Yep, bingo. And those who come seeking asylum, we should immediately have the capacity to absorb them, keep them safe until they can be heard. Anybody know who said that? <clears throat> yeah, candidate Biden. One of, first quote was 9-12-19, second quote was 6-27-19. Anybody that has a brain in their head, ears, eyes, knew exactly what was going to happen as soon as this individual became the President of the United States. They, 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 they were going to throw that border wide open. Why? I, a lot of us are asking why, and I think we're going to get into that today. I think, I think because they don't give a damn about you guys. That's what I think. 
And I've, I've been in enough of these hearings. I'm on the Homeland Security Committee. I, I'm not going to mince words anymore. I've talked to enough families that have lost their loved ones to fentanyl, MS-13 gang members, individuals on the terror watch list. We've talked to you know hospital administrators talking to us about how overrun their, their facilities are. I've seen enough of the data, enough of the evidence. Do you guys think that President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas don't know what's going on? Do you think they haven't heard enough information yet? I'm just, I'm, I said I'm not going to mince words. I think it's treasonous. I absolutely do. All right. I just looked up. Yeah. And I know that some people say, oh, that doesn't reach the legal definition of treasonous. In, treasonous involving or guilty of the crime of betraying one's country. Do you guys feel betrayed? I know I do. I know I do, and I know a lot of you guys do, too. Um, I'm going to read you guys something uh, from the uh, Constitution of the United States. This is Article 4, Section 4. The, Unar the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republic form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion. Do you guys think that President Biden and Secretary Mayorkas swore an oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States? No. Yep, they did. Are they doing that for you guys? How about, what do you think, Mr. Klim? Are they doing that? I don't think they're doing it to the best of their ability, that's for sure. Best of their ability? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Klim, why do you think they developed an app to make it easier to get people into this country? All the things that this administration has done in regards to the border are like giving somebody a bucket to bail water out of your sinking boat as opposed to fixing the leak. And that's what that app does, is to facilitate people in and in their minds get them out of Border Patrol's custody quicker. It has nothing to do with securing the border. The border is a national security uh, threat if we don't get it secured. So yes, it's about facilitating people into this country, not forcing people to do things the right way. All right. You guys all have smartphones, right? Why do you guys have apps on your phone? Navigation apps, music apps, to make it easier for you guys to do certain functions, right? That's why they created an app, guys, to make it easier for them to flood this country with illegals. And we could, we could sit here and we could talk about the different reasons why they're doing it, but the bottom line is this is a complete dereliction of duty, and they are betraying you, the American people, they don't, they don't care. They don't care. Mr. Karchner, what do you think, sir? You think, uh, do you think this administration is stupid? Do you think they don't know what's going on? Do you think they're, do you think they're so foolish that they don't know the havoc they're wreaking on the American people? I, I would dare say that it's, uh, it's no longer ineptness that, that's going on. I believe there is some uh, truth to the corruption. It's tough to ascribe anything else, isn't there, after this point? I mean, guys, it, I had a hearing this week in Homeland Security, and this, this hasn't even become very mainstream yet, but it was about um, different foreign adversaries using direct weapons, direct energy weapons against U.S. citizens that completely incapacitate citizens of the United States. You guys might have heard of it called Havana Syndrome. And then we went down to the skiff and we got a classified briefing from some of the people on the, on the panel and it was one of the most, I'm a former Navy SEAL, so I traveled around the world and hunted bad guys for a long time. But I can tell you this, when I went down to that skiff, it was one of the most terrifying briefs that I've ever been a part of, okay? This is how brazen our enemies are becoming because of how foolish corrupt, incompetent, and I would act, act, actually say wicked we have become, and our leadership has failed us at every turn. So um, this next election is going to be important. Thank you guys for coming. Mr. Chairman, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak. Uh, thank you. Um, we, we appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been told we have another mom here who's um, – I know the family. Miss, Miss Dunn. Is Miss Dunn here? I wonder. Yeah, I know, I know you know the, the – your members from Arizona, but we want to recognize you and your family. What you've had to go through is obviously what uh, Ms. Ms. Megan Alexander's had to go through too. So thank you for being with us and 
Great work. With that, I want to go to our host for his, uh, his uh, time for questioning. Uh, the gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, again, thanks everyone for being here. I, I've uh, connected with the Duns right before this and again, offer your our deepest condolences for, for what you've been through and also thank you for your, your bravery. Uh, Mrs. Alexander, I obviously had read your testimony and had read the story, but nothing like hearing it from, from you directly and from your heart. And uh, I don't think there was a dry eye in this place when you shared the pain and the grief that your family has gone through. Certainly not in this panel. As I looked around, I think we're all touched and reminded why we're here. And as a, as a father myself, as a dad of six, I, I can tell you that it doesn't matter how old your kids are or what they do, they'll always be our babies. And the pain that you and your family have gone through for the failures of this administration is beyond what words can describe, especially on the eve of Mother's Day. I can't thank you enough for your bravery and your advocacy of being here. Thank you. Thank you. Can't imagine the pain you felt when those calls were received. We can look back and look at so many things that everything could be different and we should be doing different. So I, I want to just ask you a, a broad question here. What, what in your mind we need to be doing to avoid more families going through the pain that you and the Duns have gone through and at least 300 other families in this county alone and way more of thousands around the country? Well, I think, first of all, we need to close off opportunities for people to be bringing whatever they want over our borders. Second of all, I mean, 50% of all of the fentanyl for the U.S. comes through Arizona, mm -hmm. which is shocking. That means our streets are flooded with fentanyl. Kids in junior high and elementary school are buying this like candy. So first of all, we need to close our border. We need to make it more difficult. We also need to stiffen the penalties for people that are producing, manufacturing, selling all of this. It's crazy to me when you consider the fact that 70% of the pills have a lethal dose of fentanyl in them. Of all the pills seized, every single one of those pills is a death sentence. But we aren't charging that. That's not the, what we charge people with when they're seized with all of these drugs. We charge them with possession. We charge them with production or manufacture. We charge them with intent to sell. We don't charge them with murder. But that's what this is. Thank you for that. I think that message is loud and clear. When you look at simple economics of supply and demand, you can see there the, 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 the price and the cost of making these terrible pills. Uh, on, that, on that front here, Mr. Clem, you know, one, one thing that we touched on is the gotaways, right? These are the people that cameras detected, but they were never encountered or, or uh, at any point with, with our local law enforcement or federal law enforcement. So as you look at those images walking through, they don't look like people that are um, just here for the reasons that a lot of immigrants are here for. It was mentioned that we're a country of immigrants. I believe that I'm an immigrant myself. We, you all know that. Became a citizen in 2006 and a member of Congress in 2022. No other country in the world would allow you to do mm -hmm. that. I believe in the American dream. But that abuse that we're seeing in that screen is not a reflection of that. It is not the way that that we need to do this. So when you look at these gotaways, what, what, how do you account for gotaways? How, how did you do it when you were in, in, in your position among different uh, posts? And, and how is that compared to today? Can, can we, are the numbers actually higher than they seem? And how do you calculate that? Because a lot of this that is coming in, uh, besides the ports of entry, is coming in through these gotaway individuals. Yeah, thank you. So a gotaway is some somebody that has been detected either through uh, we see it with our own eyes. We've tracked it with our, uh, you know, through sign cutting and tracking um, uh, operations, or we've caught them on video camera. But we never made the arrest. There was no law enforcement resolution. So those are reported every 24 hours into uh, into a GEPRA database, uh, and, and and those numbers are officially recorded. The the other part that is uh, always concerning is is the unknown unknowns, and and where I'm going with that is. 
there has got to be a level of, uh, of percentage uh, of people that we'd never even get to understand if they crossed or we saw them on camera or anything because we didn't get out to the border. So if we're reporting 1.8 million, we know that there, there is a percentage of people that we are just completely unaware of. And so far this year, there's been almost 170 different countries apprehended. Um, in this administration, why somebody would evade arrest by Border Patrol knowing that they're going to be caught and released should scare the heck out of everybody because the people that are evading Border Patrol are someone or something that is going to do us harm. In fact, I know that the numbers of criminals that have been encountered over the last few years of this administration have doubled, if not quadrupled some of the numbers in the previous administration. So we don't have a clue of who these people are other than just using statistics to say they're probably not people we want in this country. So as the data reflected, we're, this is the worst that we've ever seen. It's worse than the data shows being the worst that we've ever seen. I think it's a fair assessment. Uh, there is a pocket of just, we have no idea. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I want to be respectful of the time. I, uh, Mr. Chilton and Mr. Cardiner, I see them on a regular basis. I want to thank you both for being here and for, for uh, your perspective as well. I think Arizona is a state where you can see how many people that have moved here just recently and also have people that have been here for five generations. And everyone is unanimous on the opinion and the fact that this is the worst that we've ever seen. So I will take the opportunity to speak with you all also offline in order to respect the time. But Mr. Chair, I want to thank you once again, you and the committee members for coming in. And I want to tell the, the everyone here today that every member here um, gave up of their time to be here, having the opportunity of being with their constituents in their states, but they care about this issue. We've been leading this fight from Arizona. We're going to continue to do that. But as you can see here, we're not alone in this fight. We have a lot of fight in us and a lot of fighting still to do to protect our border. We will continue to do our job in doing that. So I want to thank all of you for your involvement, your passion, you giving up your time and being here as well. We're going to continue to work on this. And you can see here the dedication of my colleagues. When I go back to Washington, uh, this is who we're working with to make sure that our border is secure in spite of this administration not doing what they need to do to make sure that that happens. So thank you all. Thank you, sir. Great to see the good members appreciated here in his district like we knew he was. Um, th thank you for your leadership. Uh, I just want to go to the question that Mr. Crane uh, raised, which is the sort of the fundamental question. Why do you think they're doing it? Well, why? We know it's intentional because on day one they decided no more building the wall, no more remain in Mexico, and when you get here you will not be detained, you will be released. And they announced it to the world. And so in literally three years and four months we, uh, months we went from a secure border to no border. But it still begs the fundamental question, why? Why are they doing it? I want to know from folks on the, our witnesses, we, we are here from the, the audience too, but I want to know the people who are testifying here today, what do you think the ultimate motivation is that Mr. Crane was getting to just a few minutes ago? What do you think? I, I have an idea what I think it is, but I want to know what you guys think here on the front line. Now let's start with, let's start with, the, let's start with uh, uh, the gentleman with a few more years of wisdom than the rest of us. Let's start with the rancher if we can. You've been here, said your ranch has been in your family like 6,000 years or something, I think you said. <laughs> So, Mr. Chilton, you go first. Tell me what you think. The, what do you, why do you think Joe Biden intentionally, deliberately, premeditated fashion on January 20, 2021, changed the policies that were working and created the mess that we have heard about for years now, but certainly heard about from you in such a compelling way, Ms. Fagan, Alexander, all of you. Mr. Chilton, tell me what you think the motivation is. Mr. Chairman, it's purposeful, and the purpose is to change the demographics of this country. It's politically thought by uh, the administration, Mr. Biden, that uh, these people will vote for Democrats in the future once they become citizens and eligible to vote. It's strictly a political ploy. Mr. Clem? You know, initially, my uh, my thoughts were strictly political spite because it took um, it took all the executive actions. You know, he, he was done on started on day one yeah. in the first 30 days. I think there was 94 executive actions that directly impacted the uh, the border. 
Um, so just to undo everything from the previous administration. But over time, as you start looking at all this and you, you kind of piece it together, your brain wants to reason and try to find some facts and truth. And the only thing I can come up with is just, um, and this is sitting as a citizen here testifying, is that uh, the more people they can bring in, regardless of citizenry, they can, they can do census, they can do population right. votes and gain more, uh, more seats maybe in their favor and or electoral college votes down the road uh, to, uh, as Mr. Chilton mentioned, to swing power in their, uh, in their, on their behalf for uh, the future. I think there's no other reasoning because they're not being transparent other, yeah. than, other than us having to make this up. Politics is more important than, than what happens to, to kids like... Absolutely. Like they're about securing the narrative, not securing the border. Yep. That's kind of what I think, too. And it's, it's sad because you don't, want to, you don't want to think that about the commander-in-chief of the greatest country in history. You don't want to think that about your government, your, the people who are elected to, to high office. You just, don't, you just don't want to think that. But I, it's tough to come up with any other conclusion because, again, we're all for – you got a, you got a member of Congress who came here as a legal immigrant, did it the right way, doing an outstanding job. I mean, we're all for that. But what we're not for is the chaos, the chaos that creates situations where two young – Two young lives are gone. The Dunn family, another young. That's what we don't want. Mr. Carter, I'll give you a chance to respond. Mr. Chairman, I don't know if I have a, a, an answer for you other than to fundamentally change um, our, our country. But, but I'll, I'll carry it on one step further. Uh, if, they're, if they're looking for votes, if they're looking for that kind of stuff, why? And, and throughout my career, I would say somewhere in the 90 percentile of the people that we encountered were military age males. Yep. No, that's that's the scary element. Uh, our, the, the chairman of the subcommittee on immigration has, has warned the committee now, talk to this, talks to the entire Congress about these people coming across. Some of them we know are on the terrorist watch list, but there's a whole bunch we don't. I think someone said, I think Mr. Clemmy said earlier, you can walk right up to a Border Patrol agent, you're going to get in, you're going to get released, we know what's happening. So if you're trying to evade that, you aren't up to anything any good. And that's the scary thing, too. And again, it seems to be all done in a deliberate way by this administration, which is scary. Ms. Pagan Alexander, you're going to get the last word here, the last 30 seconds, which is probably appropriate. So you go right ahead. I think that these gentlemen are all right. I think there is political power and political gain. But I think it is also genuinely uh, a dislike for who we are as America. Yeah. I don't think that he likes who we are. I don't think he wants us to continue having freedoms that we do. I think by allowing whoever and whatever to come over the border, it changes, it shifts. And I don't think he's opposed to that. And that's very sad because I love America. Yeah, well, we want to, we want to thank uh, the four of you for, for taking time out of your busy lives and, and coming here and giving compelling testimony. We want to thank all of you in attendance. Mayor, thank you and our law enforcement for being such gracious hosts. I wish I could stay a little longer. Uh, of course, we want to thank your congressman, who, as I've said now a couple times, is doing a great job. All your team from Arizona is doing a great job. Um, plus, I... I, I tell your congressman all the time, his last name is just one of those names, Cisco Mani, just one of those names you like to say, right? It's one of those, one of those great names. Uh, but we thank you all, and we're going to keep fighting, trying to – we have Juan's bill that we passed, a bill that, that, that our committee worked on, uh, House, House Bill 2, that went through Tom's subcommittee and so much work that would actually help. But the main problem is, as Mr. McClintock started us off with saying, we just need an administration who actually enforces the current law. So we're going to continue to stress that. God bless you all. The committee is adjourned.